After getting traded to the Yankees, Alex Verdugo praised his new manager, Aaron Boone, saying he likes seeing some fire from his manager like Boone has done over the years, while also throwing shade at Red Sox manager and his former manager, Alex Cora, in the process, saying instead of airing guys out to have your players' backs. Cora and Verdugo had some tension last year before the trade in the offseason. Verdugo got benched multiple times, it just wasn't a fun time, and it seemed like Verdugo didn't appreciate how hard Cora was on him. But it already looks like Aaron Boone, like Cora, is taking some authority over Verdugo and putting down ground rules. One chain per game. Verdugo, being someone who wears multiple chains while playing, packs six for each road trip, and owns so many he doesn't even know exactly how many he has, but no matter how many he has, he's only allowed to wear one at a time now. With Verdugo himself even saying it's been hard because he's used to wearing about three or four per game. My first thought is... Eh, this just seems very on brand for the Yankees organization. They've of course had that no beard policy for many years, something that really took the aura out of Verdugo. I mean, it's night and day with him and others too, plenty others. Garrett Cole looked more badass in Houston, but now as a Yankee, he just looks like the corniest dad you know. The corniest dad you know who also happens to be arguably the best pitcher in baseball, but the point stands. Boone and the team setting rules for how many chains Verdugo can wear isn't out of character for the team to do, and hey, maybe it is something that would help to not have as many chains on. Maybe It'll help Verdugo be quicker on the bases and a better hitter or not and it has absolutely no correlation but either way he did well in the last game in Arizona. He's had a real slow start overall but maybe things will start trending better starting on this pitch that he sent deep into right for a two run bomb in extra innings. The Yankees ended up blowing it in the 10th, scored two more in the 11th and left the bases loaded in the bottom half to win the game after the umpire realized he was about to be late to his dinner reservation. Speaking of dinner reservations, Vladdy Jr's big ass is most definitely not a guy who misses any dinner reservations unlike this Christian Javier changeup that he did miss, and it's not like the Jays strike out much, but they also didn't score much. Javier did a good job, so did the rest of the pitching, and Jordan Alvarez takes down the Blue Jays. Corey Seager took this baseball to the right field corner to break a scoreless tie at the trap. The Rangers tacked on three more in the ninth inning, an inning that included one of the most shocking calls I've ever seen. Jonah Heim smoked this baseball on a line right at Jose Caballero at shortstop, only for him to just blatantly drop the ball. But the umpire said watch this and did something shocking. I mean, this was a big bigger plot twist than the ending of The Sixth Sense. This was a bigger plot twist than the ending of a Medea Homecoming. The umpires ruled this a catch and an out. So I guess the call is that he by rule caught the ball and lost it on the transfer, but I don't know, man. I was watching this game as it happened and my jaw dropped when me and the Texas Rangers announcer both had the realization that Heim was called out on the play rather than it being a hit or error or whatever. Judge for yourself, but the ball very clearly went out of the glove as quick as it entered. That doesn't seem like a catch to me, but maybe I'm just a complete idiot and it's by rule 100% the right call, which now that I think of it could be the case. Jose Leclerc made things interesting in the bottom of the inning, but the Rangers still hold on to win the series. The Marlins lost again, but that's as good as me telling you that I drank water today. That's not news. Just like Burger King inevitably ending their partnership with the Marlins. You know what is news though? The hyped up rookie Jackson Churio hitting the first homer of his career. Unfortunately, despite being up 3-1 to one at that point, the Brewers didn't hold on to it. Giving up 6 unanswered runs, the big 2 drove in 2 for the team that's called what 2 beings born at the same time is, and then Ryan Jeffers decided to just go off for no reason, smacking a baseball a mile high and just over the reach of Yelich and left for a three-run homer, and then hit a ball to Yelich and left again, this time in front of him for a single for another run as the Twins win 7-3. I do want everyone to take a moment of silence for the Pirates' chance at an undefeated season. Thank you. They were winning again, but then the Nats offense immediately went off. Joey Gallo hit his first homer as a national. The five Nationals pitchers combined to keep the Pirates' bat silent, a team that's no longer undefeated. The only team still undefeated now is Detroit, and that's because they basically just don't play. Their game Tuesday got postponed, and so did their game on Wednesday. Tigers fans cannot be happy about that, but Mets fans most definitely are. Nobody likes this team. Not other players or fans of opposing teams, obviously, but even the Mets' own fans hate this team, more than anyone, are Arguably. Hell, even their own play-by-play -play announcer, Gary Cohen, looks like he'd rather be at the DMV than be in the booth calling this team. We'll be here when the game starts, and until then, you guys just, uh, you know, get, get the snacks that you can and, and try to keep, keep nourished.
The White Sox game also got postponed. Both Chicago teams won the day before, so to risk that happening again, it rained on the south side but stayed fine enough on the north side for the Cubs to beat the Rockies again. They did almost blow this game, so gotta actually give credit to the Rockies here other than the fact that they just simply showed up to play baseball, being down 5 to nothing and 8-2 to two at points before coming all the way back to tie it. So they made it fun, but as expected, the Cubs come out on top. The Royals were on top in their game until the literal last out where Will Smith gave up a two-run single to win it. Will Smith's attempt at a save was almost as rough as Will Smith's marriage with Jada, spoiling a great start from Cole Reagans as the Orioles walk off a game that was supposed to start five hours earlier than it did. Five-hour rain delay is crazy, just like the people watching who haven't subscribed to this channel yet. You know what's also crazy? Nick Pavetta, and I love every bit of it. Credit to him, he was abysmal to start last year, had to be moved to the bullpen, something he didn't want to do, but has been awesome since, finding himself back in the rotation, combined him with Andrew Bailey's pitching lap, and you got what we've seen so far in 2024. Pavetta actually wasn't great, only pitching 5 innings because of a high pitch count, but he still was efficient overall, going absolutely nuts when his infielders turned a double play to end his outing. Both teams pitch well, neither offense could cash anyone in other than the one run for the Red Sox on a sacrifice fly. Kenley made things interesting in the ninth. The Oakland crowd was going nuts, I couldn't even hear what anyone was saying. I had to mute the TV at one point, I mean things were getting crazy, but the the hostile environment was silenced once the Sox just barely held on to win. The Reds played good baseball, Frankie Montas in the bullpen pitched really well. So did Zach Wheeler who racked up some strikeouts, but the Reds just did more overall. Ellie drove in a run which is always a fun thing. Reds win and take the series. Joe Musgrove finally had a good outing. Brandon Crawford should not be a Cardinal, that's gross. Nolan Arenado being on the Cardinals is most certainly not gross, but hitting into double plays with runners on when you're trying to come back is definitely gross. The Cardinals as a team had a fetish for double plays in this game, hitting and running and four of them. The Padres will take it though, just like they took the game to avoid getting swept. Speaking of avoiding sweeps, the Giants failed to do such a thing. Although thinking there's a chance any Jorge Soler home run will stay in play is like thinking your wife will stay. It's just not happening. Otani crushed his first home run as a Dodger, and the woman who ended up with the ball has a chance to make a lot of money, although she ended up just making a cool memory out of it by giving the ball to Shohei in exchange for another ball, two caps, and a bat while of course meeting him in person. Speaking of a chance to make a lot of money, if you bet that Miguel Rojas would be hitting home runs right out the gate this season, you'd have made a ton of money. Unfortunately, I can't think of anyone who would have taken that gamble. Jose Ramirez is definitely not someone who would have gambled because when you take less money to stay in Cleveland, I think that's the exact definition of someone who doesn't value money that much. And he just continues to do the damn thing. Cleveland absolutely pummeled Seattle to win that series. The 25-year-old starter Logan Allen did great, but what else would you expect at this point? Cleveland just pumps out good starting pitching like Mama Uganda pumps out children. You might need to look that up to fully understand, it's freaking wild. Just like the fact that there's only six games on the schedule today. That's sad, but hey, it's of course better than nothing, even if 33% of the games will involve the Mets. I'll see you tomorrow.